Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you very much to everybody that made it possible for me to be here. Um, I'll uh, start with a brief personal introduction. Uh, my name is Daniel Shepard. I work for Frost & Sullivan. I'm uh, originally half Scottish and half Mexican. Uh, I don't speak Finnish, but I do have a loose connection to uh, Scandinavia because I uh, spent a number of years working for Ericsson, so unfortunately more on the Swedish side. Um, <clears throat> My responsibilities at Frost & Sullivan nowadays are to run the ICT group uh, within EMEA. So I'm responsible for our research, our consulting, uh, and our sales uh, teams. And uh, I live in Moscow, in Russia, which is actually an interesting place to be right now for all the things that have been talked about uh, in the uh, opening speech, because there's a lot of stuff happening over there, and there's a lot of people that want to make things happen over there. The right conditions don't always exist, but I'll just echo the words that were said before, where there's a will, there's a way. Now, um, I also think that the, uh, the concept that I work for ICT uh, within a company like Frost & Sullivan is relevant here because ICT, as in Information and Communications Technologies, is the glue I see that connects the dots where we uh, talk about the future vision of things to come. Everything is somehow connected or enabled to technology. And of course, technology is increasingly becoming a software-driven thing. Uh, so fundamentally, I'm in the right place at the right time, hopefully saying the right words. Um, so let me uh, start by telling you a little bit about the presentation that I'm going to deliver, if I can get the slide to turn. Ah, there we go. Um, so I'll briefly introduce you to a body of work that we've been working on at Frost & Sullivan called Megatrends. There's actually a number of companies that have been doing similar things. Um, it's basically our view of the world to come in 2020, 2025. And we think that um, the launch of this program, which we did about a year and a half ago now, is very apt in relation to its timing because Again, as was said in the opening speech, we face a very crucial time in the world today, um, and maybe specifically in Europe, um, and I'll say a few words about that in a second, um, where we have to decide whether it's good enough to continue doing things as we always have done, or whether fundamentally innovation needs to be driven by looking at things rather differently. Now, I'm not an innovator, I'm not an entrepreneur, I'm a consultant. I've been so since I started uh, work, professional work. Um, but I've had the privilege of working with a lot of people that have been or are entrepreneurs and are genuine innovators, so I speak on behalf of them, if I may do so. So beyond the uh, Megatrends introduction, um, I'll sort of give you some insights into some of the content that has been born out of this program. And again, I've tried to draw a loose storyline around that content, but there's a whole mass of other things sitting behind that, which again, if anybody's particularly interested, more than happy to share after the fact. And then to close, I'll just summarize by giving you some pointers about why I personally think that this content really matters. Um, but I won't say anything else about that for the time being. So, introduction to megatrends. First of all, what are megatrends? Well, you can read the definition that's up there by yourselves. Um, ultimately, megatrends are supposed to be global phenomena. They are supposed to be sustainable phenomena. They're not supposed to be things that come and go. They're supposed to be very fundamental shifts in the way that the world works, be it at a social level, at a demographic level, at an economic level, at a political level, so on and so forth. And they're also, megatrends that is, are also supposed to have a magnified impact on the world as we know it. So not something that is uniquely siloed, but something that has a very broad impact. And from a business context, I would hasten to add, the impact is meant to be, again, all-encompassing. It doesn't just affect product development efforts or R&D or innovation efforts. It also impacts the way that one deals with customers, for example. Now, if I had been standing here a decade or more ago, those are some of the examples of the megatrends that we might have been talking about. Now, everything is very easy to say with the benefit of hindsight, of course. Um, nevertheless, I think we have some interesting ideas about how things are going to shape. And I'll say one thing. Not everything about the future is about imagining things that are different to what's been or what is. 
Sometimes the future is about going back to ideas that were very good to start with, but may have been introduced at the wrong point in time. So the, uh, the body of work that is Megatrends encompasses around 35 to 40 different observations that we've made. These are uh, listed on the slide that you see here. So this is the kind of full body of work that we've produced, and these are the trends that we look at. So as you can see, some of them relate to things like urbanization, social development, economic development. Some, some things are more specific to particular industries like energy. But again, the whole concept of energy, for example, has an upstream and a downstream application set. So again, very broad in terms of its concept. Mobility is a big area that we look at. And obviously, these are not isolated megatrends. Some of them feed off each other. Some of them literally are cause and effect in terms of their relationship to one another. The, uh, the slide set that I chose is all about the concept of smart. Okay? Now, why smart? First of all, and this harks back to the point that I was making earlier, that we need to start looking at things a little bit differently. If we think about innovation as kind of an incremental process towards driving things that are fundamentally different to what we have today, then I think we're starting from the wrong perspective. I think genuine innovation happens when we imagine the future and work backwards. So at the extreme of it, it's about idealizing what could be or what should be or what might be. And so I put up this slide in the first instance because it talks about innovating to zero. Now, at some level, you know, who wouldn't like to have zero debt? Who wouldn't like to have zero waste, zero accidents, zero crime, etc., etc.? It sounds utopic in nature, and indeed it is. And do I, or does Frost and Sullivan believe that by 2020 or 2025, we're going to live in a society, in a world that's descri described by zero? No, I don't think so. But my fundamental tenet when I present these, uh, these concepts here is that we need to start from a perspective of ambition and work backwards rather than being framed in today's reality and then, you know, working from there. That is by far more difficult. So we think of smart as the new green. Why do we say that? There's nothing wrong inherently with green, uh, apart from the fact that from its inception, it was uh, basically um, a feel-good factor for many people, and yet downplayed by many others because it had no genuine business benefit. Uh, everybody looked at it as a soft, nice-to-do thing, which was good for corporate social responsibility reports and nothing much more than that. Now, I happen to disagree with that perspective, but I think that the brand name, if I can put it that way, associated to green, has been problematic. So the whole concept of smart, which has sort of been elevated to a mantra-style concept nowadays, is far more powerful because it blends the best elements of what was driving green thinking with the best elements of a genuine business commercial reality. So, the other thing about SMART is that it's all pervasive. You can see on the slide the number of areas that we have sort of identified as being relevant from a SMART standpoint. And some of it's literally around technology, some of it's around infrastructure, some of it's around specific applications in healthcare, so on and so forth. The list could, in theory, be endless. So this is what, why we sort of talk about SMART as an opening statement about where the world is going because it is all-encompassing and it, it is the combination of what we aspire to and also what is technologically possible to deliver. Now when we look at it from a, uh, a city perspective, a smart city, um, there's a lot of smart concepts that can apply. And some of the stuff is far from being science fiction. Some of the stuff is happening in the world today already. So the whole concept of smart enabling citizens, for example, well, um, relating back to the, uh, to the comments being made about government debt levels, I mean, the fact that governments themselves as an isolated employer, as an isolated entity, have been struggling with their own productivity, their own efficiency, their own concept of customer service over time, you know, there's been a 
quite some changes taking place in the way that government seeks to leverage technology from a government to government standpoint, from a government to citizen standpoint, from a citizen to government standpoint, and so on and so forth. So we think that there's a lot of very interesting things that are shaping the future of a city environment, some of which is driven by indeed public institutions. Now, when we look at the, uh, at the 2020 uh, perspective, um, we think that there's going to be over 40 uh, cities which are going to be classified as smart cities populating different parts of the world. Uh, some of them you're no doubt aware of already. Amsterdam is a key case, uh, case study in point nowadays, which a lot of people are looking to in order to try and emulate but equally, some of the places where we see some of the most interesting developments for smart cities are actually in emerging markets. And, you know, why is that? Well, fundamentally, it's the age-old question of legacy. Where you have less legacy, it's easier to do things in a far more innovative way. So that's why, actually, the unwritten statement here is that over half of these uh, cities of the future are probably going to be in emerging markets, uh, especially in Asia. Uh, but there is no reason why, of course, the concepts cannot be appropriated and deployed within the Western world as well. And indeed, you see some examples of where that's taking place. The other feature about this, uh, these developments in relation to smart cities is the speed at which they can develop. Um, at the end of the day, to get to where we were to, to, to where we are today, and for example, Amsterdam has taken uh, over a decade worth of planning and execution efforts. But the interesting thing is that we see developments in India, for example, where there was nothing but a village less than five years ago, which has nowadays blossomed into a proper sort of smart or becoming smart city concept. And we see similar things happening in places in the Middle East and further east as well. So within the concept of the smart city itself, where do people spend their time? Um, well, if you guys are like me, there's basically three places where we spend our time. One of them is at home, of course, as much as we possibly can with family, etc., etc. Another one is certainly work. Uh, some of us probably spend more time there than uh, uh, one would like. And then there's the in-between part, which people call commuting. Um, and so those three stages of being are the ones where we spend most of our waking hours. Um, and so it's very important, I think, to understand the sorts of developments that are taking place to address from a, uh, from a social, societal perspective, but also from a more hard-nosed productivity and efficiency perspective, the sorts of things that are driving uh, quality of life or quality of existence, if I can put it that way. And what you'll see, for example, on this slide, which describes the smart home environment, it's, it's stuff which is not necessarily new. I mean, I've been hearing about the smart home uh, for at least getting on 12 years thereabouts. In fact, I was working with, um, now who was this with? I think it was with Telefonica, something like 10 years ago, or getting on to 10 years ago, about the smart, uh, smart home concept in Spain. And, uh, and, and to be honest, that project sort of was a bit of a flop. Um, it didn't get supported beyond the original uh, kind of business plan and conceptual plans. Why was that? It was too soon. And this is why I say that it's appropriate to look at things that have been out there in the marketplace already and bring them back because the world has moved on. And how has the world moved on? Technology has always moved faster than the ecosystem surrounding technology. So the stuff that enables technology to make an impact usually lags the clever people that are working in the innovation and R&D space who make things happen. So the whole concept of, for example, a fridge that replenishes and that auto-orders uh, the food when the food is depleted, well, that required a whole value chain to come into play which the manufacturers of the fridges couldn't possibly be expected to control, right? So this is all about the alignment of different people in a value chain, which nowadays we conceptualize much more as a, as a web or an ecosystem, um, where players are fundamentally trying to figure out how to best structure relationships that have a common benefit, well, obviously to themselves, but also to the end users. So this is just a little bit about the home side of things, and obviously there's a very big um, 
focus on things that relate to, uh, for example, security, communications, comfort, etc., etc. So this shouldn't really be a surprise. But we've also done some uh, some some uh, estimations of what this is worth, and you know, there's a genuine market size to uh, to chase after in that respect. Now the next one is about the, uh, the future of the workplace. So again, this is another place where many of us spend a lot of uh, waking hours. Um, and, and you know, I have to say again, there's been a lot of this kind of development in place for many years. Um, so a lot of this stuff around well-being, for example, you should be able to uh, relate to, especially maybe in Scandinavia, or at least in Sweden. I remember our offices in Sweden were very comfortably appointed in this respect. Um, but this, you know, we need to also understand what is driving some of this because it's not technology for technology's sake. It's not comfort for comfort's sake. You know, the whole tie back to the fundamental drivers for change. Well, if I pick on one word on this slide, well-being, right? Well-being is increasingly important as a topic in the world today because from a healthcare standpoint, well, we can talk about government at an, uh, at an overarching level, but more specifically, within the healthcare environments that governments are providing, there's a great degree of um, opportunity for improvement, if I can put it from a positive perspective, and to put it slightly more negatively, a real problem that needs to be fixed. Because, you know, on a global basis, we have aging populations. On a global basis, we have more chronic diseases than ever before. On a global basis, we have more things afflicting people than ever before. And yet, the systems that are there to support healthcare are virtually bankrupt in most countries. So the, the sort of status quo is unsustainable, right? And as a result of that, it's not just about having the opportunity to take care of problems after they've already occurred, but the question is, how does technology help you prevent things in the first place? So that one of the biggest things in healthcare today is how do we prevent things from happening? How do we prevent people from having diseases, physical ailments, problems in general, right? And so my belief or our belief is that very much technology has a role to play in that in the way that it's deployed in those places where we happen to spend most of our time. And here, again, um, so I was talking about the third part. So we spend time at home, we spend time at work, and then we spend time commuting. Uh, not everybody commutes by car necessarily, of course, but the whole concept of mobility, uh, as I said, is very, very crucial as far as we're concerned to development patterns around the world. But again, I say it's not about mobility for mobility's sake. There is a root cause or a driver for it. And uh, I think I mentioned in, on one of the first slides where I introduced the megatrends concept, um, I talked about urbanization, so urbanization is one of the key areas that we're looking at. Well, urbanization has a big impact on mobility trends, of course. Um, you know, you have a, a sort of center of gravity in terms of large cities where people need to work, but then you have a huge amount of displacement to the outside, to the suburbs, and sometimes further out than the suburbs of the city. So people are spending a lot of time commuting to get to work. I mean, London is a great case in point. People can spend upwards of two hours getting to work and from work, four hours commuting each day, which seems ridiculous. So the whole concept of, again, how does technology create an environment which is more positive rather than negative in that commuting experience? Right? So that's why we think that mobility is also very crucial, or at least one of the key reasons why we think it's very crucial. So <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about why all of this actually matters. Oops, sorry. First of all, you'll have heard of Generation Y, I'm sure. Um, they are the sort of uh, adolescents and, uh, and young adults of the world today. Um, they're a fundamentally different breed um, to, uh, to previous generations. And, and the ones coming after that, which is, I guess, where certainly my children belong, are even more fundamentally different. Now, Generation Y itself is going to make up about one-third of the world's population by 2020. And, uh, and why is that significant? 
because they're a different type of customer. They're a different type of customer in various different ways. Number one, in no particular order, but you know, technology. They are far more adept with technology than most of us probably are. Uh, they've you know, lived with it to a great extent. They use it much more pervasively than we do. And, um, and they also enjoy the concept of connectivity on a, on a sort of ongoing basis, which, you know, at least if I look at myself, that's not really the case. I, I more am the on-off type person. But um, certainly connectivity, uh, ongoing communications, interactions, social networking, all of that stuff is, is very, very crucial to these people. Second of all, it's personalization and individualization. So, you know, the day of uh, when marketing announced as a, as a kind of global concept that micro had reached the individual level, that that was the right way to segment, you know, that was quite revolutionary because at the end of the day, yes, you can come up with bundles, yes, you can come up with packages of whatever solutions you're providing, but the individual needs to be understood. The individual's needs need to be addressed. So personalization and individualization are absolutely key. Now, I said that I didn't uh, you know, want to undermine the concept of green, and one of the reasons that I don't is because people in Generation Y typically have a much more civic and environmentally friendly attitude towards things than uh, previous generations. And so, again, this is something, this is a characteristic of your customers or your future customers that you need to be able to address. Um, and last but not least, there's the fact that there is a, a level of demand for consumption, which is, as we call it, fast and furious. So everybody's heard in the telco world of the explosion of bandwidth uh, requirements and the issues that all this kind of data flowing around the network is going to have. Well, this is the kind of thing where it comes from, the use and abuse, if I can put it that way, of applications, be they in the fixed or the mobile world or any other world you care to imagine. Um, so these are the future customers, and indeed, in many ways, they're already customers. And so the trends that I was talking about before have a direct bearing on how this customer base needs to be dealt with. It also matters because I think for a long time people have been talking about ecosystems. But ecosystems, I think, have been more a conceptual uh, a conceptual word which has been used to describe how value chains don't necessarily make sense anymore because relationships are no longer linear. But I don't think that many companies have really taken it much further than that and imagined what ecosystems should actually be. So it's easy to say what they shouldn't be, but what shouldn't they what, what sh it's easy to say what they shouldn't be, but it's much more difficult to articulate what they should be and how they should work. Right? Now, the slide that I'm showing you here relates to the energy space. So you, and, and it's you know, rather simplified because there's only really three types of players that we've mapped in here. But the whole concept of even something as contained as smart grid deployments happening uh, that have happened so far require much greater integration between these different types of players than ever before because at no point can any one player be expected to expand its sphere of, uh, of understanding of capability into all of the other domains. So it's absolutely a no-brainer that partnerships are crucial to making this future smart world work, but understanding who to partner with, how to partner, making it commercially viable, those are very open-ended questions, and few and far between have been able to address that successfully. Now, this next slide I wanted to show you because, well, you can read it in your own time, I guess, or maybe while I'm, while I'm talking about it, but I'll, I'll give you the kind of storyline around it. Um, there was an analyst uh, colleague of mine based in London. His name is Saverio Romeo. I think I've even attributed him at the bottom. He went to, uh, to Nokia's uh, sort of analyst uh, day where, uh, where the senior folks at Nokia talked to the, uh, to the analyst community and described their strategy going forwards and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a very important communication platform for companies uh, because analysts pick that sort of stuff up and then turn that into insights which either bodes well or not so well for the companies in question. Now, we all know Nokia, and I believe we have somebody from Nokia here today. You know, Nokia, I think, is, uh, is largely regarded as a, as a kind of, well, for those who can really take it back, many more phases than what I'm about to say, but let's say a two-phase company so far. 
highly successful and then deeply troubled. Okay? And the question is, what's the third phase going to be of Nokia's development? Um, now, again, the reason I, I, I share this is because it has three messages that I'd like to convey. And some of it's good news for the Finns, and then some of it's more of an open question to the Europeans in, in general. Um, number one, so Nokia has had historical strengths, and, and great strengths at that. Um, one could say that for globally defined reasons, Nokia has been severely challenged over the years and has suffered tremendously as a consequence of that. Um, now, the story here is that the analyst went along to this, to this analyst day with a feeling of a big question mark looming. What am I going to hear that's fundamentally going to change my mind about how I judge Nokia in, in its current existence? And the good news for Nokia is that this analyst walked away very impressed. And he walked away thinking that all the other analysts were also very impressed because the senior leadership of Nokia managed to understand some of the fundamental opportunities or challenges and then describe uh, some of the fundamental opportunities and ways in which it was going to address those challenges. So a big thumbs up to Nokia for being able to do that under such challenging circumstances at a time when the world is facing particular difficulties and Europe continues to struggle. Now, the point, though, that he reflects on is that as a European, uh, as, a, as a region, Europe has to be doing similar things. And this sort of harks back to the whole concept of innovation. I think Europe has come to a point where it's stuck, as the English would say, between a rock and a hard place. You know, we have North America, the U.S. specifically on one side, which has really managed to maintain its innovation machine, if I can call it that. And then we've got the Asia uh, contingent on the other side, which has been driving a huge amount of power in, in our direction. And fundamentally, Europe has been getting squeezed in the middle. There's precious few globally leading companies today that stem from the ICT space that are successful uh, coming from Europe. And I think this is something that can and should change, but, but you know, boils straight back down to the age-old question, how do we innovate? And so to conclude, my comment would be that it's obviously around recognizing the future in relation to a breakaway, a real step change from the current, and it's about the underlying demand drivers, but also about the business models and, of course, the technology that supports that change. So thank you very much. That's the end of my speech. Thank you very much. So first, my, a couple of questions. I'd like to, for the start, I'd like to ask something about your agency. Yes. So to me, it's always surprising. So when you say that the future is smart, and so you have decided that that's like the main brand name that you will sell in your agency for the next three years. So that it's, <laughs> it must be a, a thousands of hours of thinking and hard work so that you decide that it's a smart one. So... Uh, how, how do you do that so that it's not so that you don't decide that the future is clever, so or that it's wise or that it's honest or whatever virtue? Because mm -hmm. we all we love all the virtues. And when I'm asking this, I have to admit that when I first time read about a year ago from New York Times, there was some columnist who also said that the future is smart. I immediately even uh, sent an email to my friend so that uh, I found it, right. so that the smart is the new key word. Mm -hmm. So that in a way, uh, I believe in your mumbo jumbo <laughs> <laughs> that you're selling, but, uh, uh, but we all know that it's in a way it's mumbo jumbo. Sure. I don't know what mumbo jumbo means. <laughs> So, nor, nor do I. I don't even know how to spell it. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the, what, well, I, I guess fundamentally, what does a company like Frost & Sullivan do? Um, again, we, we operate in, in, the, in a space which is research and, and consultancy services. So our job is to work with clients, and, and we're fundamentally about helping our clients grow their businesses. So uh, corporate restructurings and cost-cutting initiatives and stuff like that, that, that belongs to a different consultancy world. We're focused on growth. So we talk a lot to our clients about growth. And you ask about where the concept of smart comes from. Fundamentally, it's not our concept. It's about something that we have understood and heard 
our partners, our customers, our clients talk about, and we've synthesized it into the view that you see here. So it's, uh, it's much more of a trend that we heard being described, which we kind of helped give a name to, although we're far from the only ones that call it this, as you've pointed out. Okay. So uh, uh, the next question is that if we know that the green is a bad uh, brand, <laughs> So do you advise the green parties to change their names to the smart parties? <laughs> if you're talking about, are you talking about the political parties? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, because I mean, we all know that this problem of green, so it's something very uh, yeah. worn and cozy and uh, not effective enough. So I, I'm sure that the green, have, green parties have this problem. Yeah, I'm, well, ser I'm serious. Well, the, 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 that could describe why they don't usually get voted in, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, would I advise them to change their brand name? It probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, they would stand out against their competitors quite nicely, who tend to have fairly boring names. But, um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think uh, the whole sort of political world also needs to switch on to this sort of idea. And I think, you know, in many areas they are, um, because the whole concept of public-private partnerships it's, it's rife around the world. There's a lot of good examples where this is taking place, be it in transportation, be it in infrastructure developments. I just think it's got a lot more to do in that respect. And one of the key challenges I would add is that, uh, and it's not too dissimilar in the corporate world, of course, it's the ability to see things through. So projects, if you will, tend to be defined on fairly short timelines because that's the tenure that people have in office yeah. or in corporate office. <laughs> My third question and last question uh, this time is, uh, is about ecosystems. You, you say that uh, value chains uh, don't make sense anymore, mm. so that uh, uh, the linear world is over, and you talked about the partnerships, that, that they are crucial. Uh, I kind of understand what you're talking about, that when people, I think that people who are working maybe in software business, they are more uh, familiar with the idea of ecosystem. But to, to me, it's something that I always like, kind of try to reach, but I don't fully understand. So deepen a bit this idea about that value chains don't make sense anymore. So Okay. I, I mean, in a, I guess in a, in a simple way, uh, a value chain, at least in the way that I conceptualize, conceptualize of it, is very much, um, you know, one supplier feeds another one, that feeds another one, that ultimately feeds an integrator or something along those descriptions that then provides a service or a product to the end customer. And, 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 and while that's all good and well in some areas, um, when we're talking about more complex developments that require different types of skill sets to come to, to play to provide exactly that solution, I think you know, it's, it's very difficult for companies nowadays to develop all the capabilities necessary. So as an example, um, machine to machine is a, is, a, is a big thing in the world today, uh, the whole sort of uh, device connectivity uh, issue. And, and what you have is you have telecom companies, IT companies, integration companies, and various others trying to address the M2M space. But if you think about something like machine to machine in healthcare, you know, do I expect Vodafone to de develop the kind of health-oriented capabilities that a healthcare provider has, or to develop even the technology competencies that the guys that like Philips and GE that make the healthcare devices have? No, no, no absolutely no. not. So it's about that kind of partnership um, but it's no longer one feeding the other, it's several people feeding into each other because it's much more of a dynamic system. Yeah, I'm sure that we will, in a discussion, we will go deeper to that, what kind of ecosystems will be also in Nokia's part, because it's yes. uh, crucial to, uh, I still believe, to Finland, or I hope that it's crucial to Finland also. Uh, what about, about, do you have any questions to Daniel? Here's one. I am Lauri Grön from Synesthesia Software Music. Uh, do you know the concept of neuroplasticity? Of, of what, sorry? Neuroplasticity. No. Well, you should. <laughs> because it means that uh, the modern brain research has shown that uh, how one uses information, for instance, if one reads book or use internet, there are it makes anatomical changes 
in one's brains at all ages oh, yeah. and also changes the memory system, the long term memory. It means, for instance, and it has been shown that uh, people who use a lot of internet or those smart systems, they become less creative. So it means that uh, if we believe in that research that your smart future will be more stupid and l less creative future. I, I think you should uh, also study, for instance, uh, Nicholas Carr in his book has popularized this concept. You should read it because you are a bad prophet without reading it. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I understood the, uh, the last words. Um, however, I think one, one point to, uh, to make is that uh, I understand the, the idea, I mean, to put it into some form of uh, kind of, uh, maybe into my own language if I, if I may, you know, people's handwriting got worse as a result of SMS, people's spelling got worse as a result of SMS, uh, people who use computers by and large are, are, are being talked about as losing the ability to socially interact, uh, at least in the common sense of the word. Um, and, and, and of course interaction between human beings is what spurs creativity. Um, so the, the, the one thing I'd just like to sort of uh, clarify about everything that I said is that at the end of the day I'm not talking about this as a replacement for the importance of human interaction. That's very much got to be a part of it. However, the way in which people do is, is changing, and that's just uh, a reality. Um, you know, the, I, I don't disagree that there are challenges associated to that, and that there is a risk that by creating these electronic boundaries between people, uh, there, there are issues that stem from that. But I think for, for, from that standpoint, that's the kind of potentially negative conclusion that stems from it, but I think equally, it's all about the application and the way that it manifests itself. So usually an idea is only good or bad depending on how it's applied, not because the idea inherently is good or bad. Uh, I, I think that I've read the article about this book and it also, if I remember right, uh, it uh, also uh, explained that the similar kind of uh, brain damage happened uh, when uh, writing was invented and when compass was found. Mm -hmm. So that every time the kind of a concept of our uh, mindset totally different. So even when the time was understood first time, you know, when nobody, or maybe you know that it was no more sun. But the idea is that you, you live in a certain, uh, in evolution, you have a different ways of thinking about the future. And uh, uh, Internet has most likely been one of those five things, like in this book, very interestingly. I think it's, again, kind of a mumble-jumble science, but so it's very interesting. Uh, so please read it. It's, uh, it's good for you when you are thinking about the big trends. Happy to take the recommendation. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, if you are, are we talking about the same, big, same book? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, any other questions? If not, oh, yes, this one. Okay. <laughs> I have thick skin. Yeah. Sorry, Apollo. Hello. Uh, I was slightly concerned looking at your map of uh, smart cities. I could see several Nordic, con uh, Nordic city cities, but n n none in from Finland. So uh -huh. have we lost the game already? Yeah. Good question. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's quite like that in terms of a game that one uh, loses or, or, or wins. Um, I, I'm not even sure, actually, uh, from memory, whether the slide has all the cities mapped into it, because it says over 40, and I don't remember there being 40 bubbles. Um, nevertheless, I, you know, I think that um, the, the pace of change is such that it doesn't mean that if, let's say, there's nothing really worth mapping there today, that by taking certain decisions and making certain plans come to fruition, that there cannot be, in short order, a place for Finland. I, I don't see this as a, uh, as, a, as a race that has a start line and a finish line as such, um, where uh, you know, your concept of having lost out applies. I think there's always a place for something to develop, uh, and it just requires the right people to make that happen. One more question. Yeah, I would like to say that Helsinki is also the design capital of the 
uh, next year, and so the main idea is just to make the things function well, and so it's more about functioning than designing, so maybe it, it will be the uh, start of the, this new, new cities. Please. Yes, hi, Reinomaan. In, in your presentation, you were kind of uh, bipolar on home and work, uh -huh. and then community between those, but for some people there's also kind of a third life, which is the laser time, hobbies, and so on. <laughs> what about uh, smart in those things? You know, do you see that as an area of, of uh, potential uh, development or, or so? I certainly do. Uh, there is a uh, there, there's there's a um, well there's there's a couple of slides that I could have included in here that talk about various things related to uh, entertainment, uh, you know your your hobbies and what have you, which uh, for example pull on concepts of virtual worlds and whatnot. Uh, so the, the even conferences, um, so not related to the workplace per se, but more about places where you go, things like conferences. Um, so there's a lot of the application of that technology that includes those sorts of environments. So there's no reason to exclude it. I was merely pointing out three things which uh, seem to dominate. Of course, another way is uh, there's plenty of people that work from home. So <laughs> you know, some of those things become one and the same. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's some material on that as well. If you're interested, I can more than happily share that with you. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Let's stop for the time being. Okay. And our next, next 